Good afternoon, everyone. So I am Llorenzo Escola Farras, and today I'm going to talk about a work that uh, we recently posted on archive with Florian Spielman. I am a PhD at QSOP, University of Amsterdam, and m and and I'm going to talk about this paper, Single Qubit Loss Tolerant Quantum Position Verification Protocol Secure Against Entangled Attackers. So please find in there the QR code that uh, brings you to the archive link. Very well, let's get started. So this is the outlook, and what the, it changed the font of, yeah, it'll be all right, I guess, but it changed the font of my presentation. But first, I'm gonna give you an introduction about the topic, what is position verification, what, how to introduce the quantum counterpart in there, uh, the previously known weaknesses of protocols, and I will end with our results about the topic. Okay, first of all, what is position verification? Like, it's self-explanatory a bit, uh, so we assume that uh, we have in a map, and you want to verify someone's location. So let's zoom in in a map, and we have a map of Europe, and then I see that also it gets changed in here, uh, so that would be a prover, in this position, let's say in Aveiro, and the prover through all this talk is going to be me. Myself, I'm gonna prove uh, my location uh, for some people, to some people that do not trust me. So it could be that my promoter who is in Amsterdam, and also my supervisor in the Canary Islands, probably having a better time than us and getting some rest. So that would be another verifier, and they don't trust me that I did come here to, to the TQC conference, so they want to verify that the money that they are spending is worth it, and I actually came here to give the talk. So they're gonna send me a message, and then these messages are going to be a challenge that they have to perform and respond back to them. Okay, so to make it more precise, I'm gonna show you the more general one-dimensional classical position verification scheme, which is the following. We have a position in a line, and there's a prover, that would be me, and I want to convince two verifiers that I'm in the location that I claim to be. So consider the time arrow, this one, and consider the light cone in V0. And also consider the light cone in V1. So these two people, V0 and V1, are going to be located in such a way that the messages that if they send at the speed of light arrive at P at the very first time, and they intersect in there. And here, from one side, I get message X, from another side, I get the message y, and here I have to compute a challenge. That is like a function given x and y. And then in my light cone, I have to respond at the speed of light so that both answers, a, are correct and arrive on time. Very well. And this is all based on the fact that this thing that I took from Star Wars, it's traveling faster than the speed of light, is not allowed by the laws of physics. Okay, but there is a universal attack for that that I'm gonna tell you now. So assume that instead of me, we have our beloved friends, Alice and Bob, that are on my right and on my left, and instead of me being here, they wanna cover me, and they cooperate so that they fool the verifiers. How do they do that? In this way. So X and Y, the messages are intercepted by Alice and Bob, respectively. Alice makes a copy, broadcast one part to Bob gives a part to herself. Bob does the same, so they inter uh, interchange the messages, and here, Alice has X and Y, and of course, the challenge is publicly known. Same for Bob, and now they only have to respond to the closest verifiers, V0 and V1. And what happens with that? That we have that both, uh, both answers are correct and arrive on time. So the, per the verifiers are fooled. Okay. But what happens if we go to the quantum realm? That there is the no cloning theorem. So assume that we have a machine. And of course the machine is gonna be quantum. So that's why I put this atom in there. And now we have Dolly, the quantum ship. And you put Dolly inside of the machine and you take two Dollies, two identical copies of Dolly. And that is not allowed by quantum physics. The no cloning theorem says that if you have an unknown quantum state, that cannot be copied. So this is completely forbidden. So what happens? That if now we add the magic word in here, which is quantum, 
So instead of position verification, we put quantum position verification QPV, and we show that quantum is better than classic, we don't lose our jobs. So instead of sending X from one side, you send also quantum message, row zero. Instead of sending Y, you send row one, and you might have to answer something that is also quantum. And what happens with that? That first of all, we prevent copies, and we prevent the whole attack that I explained before, the classical one. Because this thing, a machine that takes row zero and makes two copies, and row one and outputs two copies, it is forbidden. Okay. Let's go to a more concrete protocol to make things more clear. So we, I'm going to introduce the QPV BB84 protocol that was originally introduced by Ken Mundro and Spiller in 2011, and it's called BB84. It resembles a bit like to the QQD BB84 protocol. So you take a BB84 state, either zero, one, plus, or minus from B0, and you send it to the prover P. And from the other side, you send a bit saying zero or one, which denotes in which basis you have to measure the qubit, either the computational for zero or the Hadamard basis for one. So if you send zero or one as a state, you're gonna send measure in the basis zero, computational, and otherwise measure in the Hadamard basis. So you take both things that arrive at the same time. We assume that computation doesn't take time, and then you output the answers and you broadcast them to the verifiers. Okay, how to attack this? Assume that you have one EPR pair shared by Alice and Bob that are placed like this, and Alice intercepts the qubit. She does a teleportation measurement. She broadcasts the outcomes of the teleportation measurement, and Bob measures the local register in basis that he intercepted, and then broadcasts the result. And here at this stage, they have enough information to recover what a prover in P would have, get, would have got. Okay, and here that's a way to uh, fool the verifiers. But, okay, let's study security under certain assumptions. What if they do not pressure entanglement? So there's a result that shows that the best probability that you can attack this protocol is cosine squared pi over eight, which is roughly 85%. So that gives us some hope. And actually, I want to say that all quantum position verification protocols can be attacked. That is a big no-go theorem, but we don't lose hope because the best known general attack so far requires an exponential amount of entanglement to attack it. And for practical effects, this can be really complicated uh, to be true. So our goal is to find an easy protocol, which is very difficult to attack. Okay, and we shouldn't forget also the experimental implementations because we face some problems that are big enough that force us to redesign our protocols. Okay, so first of all, you send the photons, and you usually do that over some distances through optical fibers. First problem that we face, photon loss. Lots of photons, if the distance is long enough, get lost. And second of all, the quantum information travels slow, roughly at two thirds of the speed of light, if, so we are like, I'm gonna put a snare here as a symbol of a slow thing. Uh, but the thing is that I said before that everything is based on sending messages at the speed of light. But now we're sending something much slower than the speed of light. And that assuming that we have a straight line between the prover and the verifier. But what if we have a quantum network which is not exactly in a straight line? So we also have to face that thing. And I'm gonna show how attackers can take advantage of these two things. First, how can you take advantage of photon loss? So assume that the photon that you sent was lost but Alice intercepts it. So Alice measures in a random basis that she guesses and obtains an outcome, broadcasts the classical information, and Bob broadcasts the classical information that he intercepted, and at this stage, if Alice, I'm sorry for that, uh, like, if Alice was right in her uh, guess, so you answer what you got as an outcome, and otherwise you send, okay, the photon was lost. So with that attack, you can be correct half of the times, so you're gonna guess correctly the basis, and half of the time, you can say that the photon was lost. Then, you have a perfect attack if more than half of the photons are lost, which it does happen for certain distances. Okay, and how can you take advantage of slow quantum communication? So you send the photon, and it travels slow. So you have to send it before sending the classical information from the other side. So like here, we're assuming that Alice and Bob have better technology than we do, 
So they can communicate at the speed of light. So Alice sends the qubit to Bob, and Bob has all the information he needs to. He has the classical information, so measures in the basis that he got, and then just broadcast the outcome. And at this stage, they can just respond to the closest verifier. And then they fool the verifiers as well. OK, <clears throat> I would like to introduce to you uh, what I named the Bermuda Triangle of Quantum Position Verification, where instead of having Bermuda, we have photon loss as a problem. Instead of having Puerto Rico, we have slow quantum information. And instead of having Florida, we have entanglement, which are the three problems that I mentioned so far. OK, so we know that there are photon loss, like fully loss tolerant protocols. We also know that our protocols that are resistant against a certain amount, reasonable amount of entanglement. And we know that there are protocols that are slow, quantum information secure. And we also know that these two things can be reached simultaneously. But so far, it was not known if this area was dangerous and if we could send or not planes and they would explode. And it was nicer in the original one because the explosion was in red. But uh, just imagine a red explosion. OK. So as a summary of the three main problems, I can show you this triangle. Like here on um, the top right, you have loss. Here you have slow quantum information. And here you have, even if you perform it perfectly, there's an attack just sharing one EPR pair. <laughs> OK, actually, the goal that I said before, I want to correct it a bit and say that easy to implement, very difficult to attack, and resistant to experimental constraints. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So step one, let's analyze the loss. So the first thing is that we introduced this parameter here, eta, which is the transmission rate from V0 to P, like the quantum channel communicating V0 and P. So eta photons are, uh, in proportion are going to arrive to the prover. And now we have also to consider, like the photon that is sent here can be lost sometimes. And we have also to consider a valid answer, because sometimes the Honest party is going to respond the photon was lost. I didn't get a quantum message. So that has to be taken into account. OK? So we're going to introduce an error that the prover, the prover is, be, uh, is going to be subject to. And this error, it could be either like the channel communicating V0 and P. You could just flip a 0 to a 1. So that would induce some error. You can also have a measurement device that makes an error when you measure, you got a zero state, but sometimes because of errors, you get a one. So those things have to be taken into account. And at the end, you're going to expect a certain fraction of correct answers from the prover, which is going to be eta times that he receives the photon. And one minus an error, he's going to be correct. So that's uh, the probability that you expect correct answers from the prover. Very well. Let's study security, and I repeat, with unentangled attackers, because if we have entangled attackers, there's a perfect attack. So let's study the, the security with unentangled attackers. And the goal is to find an upper bound of uh, the attacker's probability to be correct when they try to, to fool the verifiers. OK, so I'm going to sketch the more general attack that can be in that scenario. Alice intercepts the qubit and couples to some ancillary systems that she has, sends a register to Bob and keeps a register for herself. Bob, without loss of generality, the most general thing that he can do is just to broadcast the classical information, because any quantum thing that Bob could have done, Alice could also do. <laughs> so it's just broadcasting the classical information. And at this stage, they have a quantum state. Let's call it Pro. And now they have to answer to the closest verifiers. And what is the more general thing that they can do is to perform a P of the M. So depending on X, Alice is going to output A. And depending on X, Bob is going to output B. And all those A's and B are going to be either 0, 1, or a photon was lost. And they just respond to the verifiers. And actually, we get our first result, which is that the optimal probability of winning for, a, for being correct for attackers is given by this expression, cosine squared pi over eight times eta plus sine squared pi over eight times one minus eta. And this holds for eta from a half to one, because remember that I said at some point that if more than half of the photons are lost, you can just guess the basis in which you have to measure as Alice, and there's a perfect attack. So that was already known. And we cover the spectra that was not known. And recall that if eta is a half, you have here one half, because you have cosine squared plus sine squared. 
So the probability of being correct is a half, and the other half you say no photon. So that was actually the optimal probability when you have a photon loss one half. And on the other hand, if you have eta equals one, we have cosine squared pi over eight, which is the 0.85 that I said at some point that it was already known. Okay, nice. So I'm gonna sketch the proof in here, and what do you do when you want to study security of a prepare and measure protocol? So most of the times you purify it. You say that the verifiers, instead of sending a qubit, send half of an EPR pair. So the verifier is gonna measure either in the computational or in the Hadamard basis, given those measurements that I said here, computational and Hadamard. And also the probability of being correct then is given by this expression. And I don't know if you can see the pointer, but here, the output of the verifier has to coincide with the output of Alice and Bob, so they are correct. Next, the probability of being wrong is that they give the complementary answer. Instead of A, they give A minus one, or one minus A, sorry. And then there's a certain probability of having no photon, which is given by this expression, and finally, there's a probability of a board, and since the prover is going to manipulate classical information, a prover is never going to send inconsistent answers. So then I will fix the very last term to zero. And now we would like to upper bound the first guy in there, the probability of being correct, but we don't know how to, or we didn't, but we did know how to upper bound something else. So if you consider the probability of answering defined as follows, so the probability of being correct plus the probability of being wrong, we have the following expression, and notice that it no longer depends on, on the measurement V, that the, the verifier does. So it can be upper bounded by the so-called NPA hierarchy, which you can find it as a semi-definite program that can be computed on a classical regular computer in polynomial time. So it is this maximization problem, so maximize over certain linear constraints. And here the SDP leads to a trivial bound, but we can combine it with extra linear constraints. So first of all, this thing that the verifiers are never, the, are never gonna accept inconsistent answers, so whenever A and B are different answers, you set this probability to be zero. And second of all, we could find a proposition that says the following, we can relate other types of entries that are going to be relevant with the probability of error that the verifier has and these two things that the prover measure. So actually, from here we find an upper bound and from here, we find a lower bound, which is the, the best two attacks for guessing and not guess and the optimal attack, and they happen too much. So we have the first result, and in terms of experimental parameters, we can show this. If you have your transmission rate eta, and you have your probability of error, you know where you are, and you know if the protocol is secure or it's attackable. Okay, but it is still insecure if they share a single EPR pair, that part I didn't forget, so let's fix it. So use uh, the previous step to fix that. So actually, if we slightly modify this protocol, and instead of sending a qubit and a basis, you send classical information from both sides, bit strings of length n, and you say, okay, you have to measure given a function f that is either zero or one, and you have to measure in the basis that the function gives, computational or Hadamard. So this extension was proven to be secure by attackers that pre-share entanglement, like a bounded amount, and arbitrary is low quantum information. Okay, so now we do our job and we introduce the laws in here. And this thing, if we combine the previous result that, we, that I showed you, this like plot that I showed, okay, this is secure in this region, it's not secure in that region. So that leads us to a technical lemma that combined with the techniques of the other people that proved a case to be secure with entanglement, it leads us to the main result, which is the following. So if you have the number of pre-shared uh, qubits by the attackers is linear in N, plus arbitrary slow quantum information, plus photon loss, the protocol is still secure. And we have a similar plot, but the results are not tight, so we have a region where the protocol is secure even if entanglement is shared at the beginning by the attackers, and a region where you can find an attack. Okay, so this means that if we have the people that perform the protocol and the attackers, even if they have loss, the classical information that they have to manipulate is 2n on both sides. The number of qubits here is one, but here is n over half minus five, which 
if you send one kilobyte of classical information from both sides, you still have to manipulate one qubit as the Honest Party, but 4,000 entangled qubits if you are attacker. So that is much easier than what the attackers would do. And what we actually did is to push this edge a bit so that you can send planes now in here. And now I'm going to sketch that because I don't have time, but if you add more bases instead of just zero one a computational hammer, you add more bases, the protocol becomes more loss tolerant. So actually, I, will, I mean, if uh, later I have time for questions and stuff, I show you a way that you can even push to two thirds and four fifths of loss, and you can still send planes in here. And with that, I will conclude and thank you for your attention. Yeah, if that's okay for you. Yeah, it happens to be the case that you have the, um, the same probability of, of winning. And actually, this is, I, um, I'm not sure like how is the connection, because, uh, but I can tell you what's the optimal strategy that as an attacker, you would always say in a brave bear state, like the one that's half, uh, like in the same way from zero to plus, like the state that it's in between, so that has maximum overlap with the zero and the plus and you always guess zero as an outcome, and that would be it, and that's why it has this cosine square of pi over eight, because this state has this angle. Uh, but I don't know if there's more of a fundamental reason for that to have exact same value as the CHSH game, because this, at some uh, sense, resembles a bit of a non-local game when you study the security, but here there's one round of communication, so things can be a bit messed up. Uh, I don't know if you are reasonably satisfied with my partial answer. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your talk. I was just going to, I guess, give you a chance to expand a little bit. Um, you mentioned the different bases, so is the intuition there that that addresses photon loss more because... Um, so you're saying about, because uh, I also have a bit of trouble to hear, about sorry, well, when you, you send more bases, right? You mentioned this at the very end, so I was just yeah, going to ask Yeah, I can go that. back to here, and I can explain it a bit. So. You want intuition why this is more secure with photon loss? Yeah, I, was, I yeah, guess. Definitely. So I, here, yeah. if you guess the basis, you're going to be correct with a half of probability. Mm -hmm. And here, if you have to pick among three bases, so you have a third of being correct in an attack. Right. And we can now show that this is an attack, but of course, this is just a lower bound. You can do better than something that you know. But with the very same techniques that I showed at some point, but I know that I talk about lots of things, you can find an upper bound, and they also happen to match at one third. And the more bases you put, you don't need them to be only mutually embased, um, biased bases, but the more bases you put, for instance here, we computed the results for five bases, and we had lost tolerance for 
a transmission rate greater than a fifth. And because here you have a fifth of probability of guessing the basis, so that's a bit the right. intuition. And we tried even with more bases, and we showed that there's this trend of one over m. But of course, this is not an analytical proof because we just show it for very speci for specific cases. And now, if you are an experimentalist, and we show how to compute it, if you need more loss tolerance, you just put some experimental parameters. We have uh, an SDP that you have to compute it, and you go and you compute it, and you can know if this is secure or not for the, the parameters that you manipulate in the lab. OK, thank you. Welcome. Further questions? All right, in that case, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.